Welcome back. This is session number three of the 2018 Virtual Genealogy Fair. The lecture is for the beginner skill level and up. It is entitled All Spared in Love and War, the Civil War's Widows Pensions Files by presenter Alexandra Villasarin. She will discuss records from the Civil War and war with Spain. They contain claims from widows to prove their entitlement for pensions based on deceased veterans military service. Ms. Villasarin is a processing archives technician at the National Archives in Washington, DC. I'm turning the broadcast over now to Alexandra. Thank you and welcome for everyone who's joining in on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, my name's Alex. I'm processing technician here in Washington, D.C., commonly known as Archives One. Um, today I'll be talking about the case files of approved pension applications of widows and other dependents of the Army and Navy who served mainly in the Civil War and the War with Spain, commonly known as the Widow Certificates or WC files. They're part of Entry 12A, the National Archives Identifier 30020, in Record Group 15, Records of the Department of Veterans Affairs. They're a heavily used record series for genealogists and social historians. These files contain records received by the Bureau of Pensions from widows to prove entitlement for pensions based on their deceased husband's military service, as well as records created by the Bureau that document actions it took concerning the applications. So earlier this year, I was part of a textual processing team here at Archives One that recently completed a five years old holding maintenance project on the widow certificates, AKA the WC files. Together our team has processed 84,295 boxes, which is a total of 42,484.68 cubic footage. Individually, that is 1.6 million case files, so 1.6 total widows. If you're looking for the widow's pension files themselves, they're digitized in part on fold3.com. Those that are not are available to research in person here at Archives One in Washington. Confederate pension files can be found in the records of southern and border states. So on the left side, you have what we call Hollinger boxes. They're long-term archival storage boxes. And on the right side, if you come to research in the research room, this is what you'll actually receive. This is an envelope containing the full documents of the widow's pension files, including the application, the granted certificate, and any corroborating evidence included. So the majority of pension files became inactive around 1930. For those that were still active around this time, those files are with the Veterans Administration. In your search for a specific individual widow's pension, begin your search here at NARA. If your requested file is not in our holdings, we can direct you to where it might be. So in 1936, when these records came to the National Archives, each file was a bundle of folded papers. You can see that in the photo on the left where the WPA worker is processing these files. Um, the way they were originally um, accession into NARA, they were tri-folded, so if you've ever folded up a letter size paper um, twice to be able to fit it into an envelope, that's called a tri-fold. You can see in the boxes um, that she's got against the wall, those are how they originally came. And part of her job was to flatten them out, and they were put into the humidifying chamber, which you see in the photo on the right, to ensure that they remain flat for long-term storage. So upon arrival, these, as I previously mentioned, they were flattened and placed in the large acidic envelopes and large acidic open-ended cardboard boxes. The way we do things at the archives today, that's not really up to our standards. As part of the National Archives' continuing commitment to preserving and protecting the records in its custody, my duties as an archives technician had included working on a team that completed rehousing the case files into acid-free, low-lignant envelopes and archival boxes that are appropriate for long-term storage. And this is all in the course of trying to make these records um, last and to make them accessible for researchers. So when it came to soldiers' pensions, the law for what conditions qualified changed over the years. 
from loss of limber eye to disability from service, wounds, or disease, and lastly, to old age. When a soldier applied for a pension, his file was designated a soldier's original, or SO number. That's the first line on the screen. When it was approved, it was filed under soldier's certificate number, or SC number. When a widow applied for a soldier's pension, her file was designated a widow's original, or SO number. When it was approved, it was filed under a widow's certificate, or WC number. And that's what I'll be talking about today, the WC files. So in the course of this presentation, I'll go over how to look up an individual in the pension index. Then I'll go over some documents you might find in the file. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about the narrative you can put together using the information gleaned from these documents. I tried to pick a really interesting one. So there's a couple of indexes you can use to begin your search. Um, the first one is microfilm roll T288, the general index to pension files 1861 and 1934. These are available to research in person in the microfilm room here at the National Archives in DC. And they're also available online through our partners at ancestry.com. When you're searching for an individual, these index cards are arranged by surname, then first name, and they do include the names of widows and other dependents. The second record series for the pension files, or the second index for the pension files, I'm sorry, is record, or microfilm roll T289, the organizational index to pension files of veterans who served between 1861 and 1900. As the previous, as like the previous index, these are available to research at Archives One and also in full at full3.com. Unlike the previous index, these are arranged by state, type of service, then regiment, then company, then soldier's name. In general, it does not in indicate the name of widow or the guardians of minors. In general, they're more likely to indicate a date of death of the veteran. As an aside, you can access archives and or you can access Ancestry and Fold 3 at any NARA field office. Many public institutions will also often make these sites available, like libraries, universities, etc. So this is an example of a pension index I found um, on microfilm roll T288. This particular image has been sourced from our partners at Ancestry.com. You can research the index in person here in Washington, DC. So here we can see that the soldier, William H. Chick, previously of the 17th Maine Infantry, applied for an invalid's pension on July 3rd, 1865. Upon his death, his widow, Laura DeEtta Stoneberry Chick, applied for his pension on September 11, 1916. Her application was approved, and William's files were consolidated into a single WC file under certificate number 815792. What's unusual about this index entry is that it includes space and information for a contested widow. Anna S. Chick Townsend. We see that she applied on May 18, 1917 for William Chick's pension, which by then was already being dispersed to the woman first listed as his widow, Laura. Some other information you can derive from this card include the date of filing, the state from which they filed, and any additional remarks be included in the, in the last section. This is another index card, also sourced from our partners at Ancestry.com. The same woman listed as William Chick's contesting widow in the previous index card entry appears in this entry as Annie S. Townsend. We can see here that she applied for Charles Townsend's pension as his widow on November 20th, 1896. Her files are available for research under widow certificate file number 893807, which you can see listed in the column under certificate number. In the upcoming slides, I'll be using some documents pulled from this file to illustrate examples of what you might find in a widow's pension file and how they may be of use to you in your genealogical research. So 
So here are some documents you might find in a typical widow's pension file. If a widow's husband had applied for an invalid pension prior to his death, his pension files will be consolidated with the widow's claim in the WC file. These particular documents were included in Annie Townsend's file, the widow from the index card listed as a contested widow to another soldier, William Chick. She had been married to both men, uh, first to William Chick and then secondly to Charles Townsend. Invalid pensions typically include an application for an invalid pension by a disabled soldier. Uh, that's the leftmost document. And this includes information about the soldier's address, military service, and the nature of his disability. Here we can see that Charles Townsend of the 35th Massachusetts Volunteers was shot in the hand during the Battle of Antietam and subsequently had the first and second fingers of his right hand amputated. This claim, of course, needed to be supported by corroborating evidence. Included here is the officer's certificate to disability of soldier in which Townsend's first lieutenant confirms his injury. That's the third most document from the left. Also included as part of his claim is a certificate of a disability for discharge. From this document, we can glean that Private Charles Townsend was five foot seven. He had dark complexion, eyes and hair, and prior to his service, he was employed as a machinist in Massachusetts. And that is the rightmost document. So files also typically include examining surgeon certificates from the soldier's claim to an invalid pension. As archivist Clara Kluskins writes in the spring 2010 volume 42 issue of Prologue magazine, an act of July 14th, 1862 required veterans to submit to examinations every two years by a local civilian doctor chosen by the commissioner of pensions. Congress left the number and locations of these civilian physicians to the discretion of the commissioner and 172 civilian doctors were appointed by November 15, 1862 in those places, quote, where the convenience of applicants seem to require such an officer. As the number of veterans needing examinations grew, so did the number of physicians appointed from 172 in 1862 to 1,578 in 1877. Totally disabled veterans were not required to go to biannual examinations. While the Pension Act of 1862 did not expressly define disabled, the Pension Office continued to follow the express language of the Act of April 10, 1806, and the Office's established precedent that disability was measured by the veteran's capacity for procuring a subsistence by manual labor, not by whether he could perform the particular kind of employment he had before military service. An act of July 14, 1862 provided an $8 a month pension to private soldiers for total disability for the performance of manual labor, while the act of June 6, 1866 provided a pension of $20 a month, which was later increased to $24 a month, for disability incapacitating for the performance of any manual labor. Ensuring that competent and scrupulous physicians and surgeons did examinations was an important concern in most counties, a single physician conducted the examinations. In larger cities, boards of three or more physicians were established with the requirement that at least two of them jointly conduct the examinations. From 1882 to 1883, the pension office changed the system so that a board of three first-class physicians and surgeons jointly conducted all examinations. Although the cost of paying three doctors, $2 each, was greater than paying a single examining doctor, the more accurate results saved the government money, always an important concern. Boards were geographically established so that no claimant was required to travel more than 40 miles to reach one by rail, which was an important concern because roads were not paved. These records also include the Declaration for Widow's Pension as well as the Widow's Certificate. Seen here is Annie Townsend's initial declaration, which was rejected on the grounds of insufficient proof of dissolution of a previous marriage to a veteran who was still living. Later, after much legal wrangling and correspondence, she was granted a pension under the Act of April 19, 1908.
So in order to receive a widow's pension, the widow had to provide proof of marriage to the deceased veteran. She had to show proof of her husband's death. And in the 1890s, she might have been subject to a means test, proving that she had no overly valuable property. Having initially been denied her second husband, Charles Townsend's pension, due to insufficient proof of divorce from her first husband, William Chick, Annie Townsend proceeded to apply for William Chick, her first husband's pension, as well. That's why she's listed as a contested window on his index card. So unusually, the files for both her first husband, William Chick, and the files for her second husband, Charles Townsend, are compiled together in one single WC file. It stands to reason that Annie thought if she were not Charles Townsend's widow in the eyes of the Bureau, then surely she must be William Chick's widow. Therefore, as part of her application, Annie has included a copy of her marriage certificate to William Chick, which is the image on the left, as well as his death certificate, which is the image on the right. So other vital records are often included in the file to support the widow's claim. These might include marriage records, like the certificate seen here, stating that Otis L. Leonard officiated the wedding of Anna Chick and Charles Townsend in Rockport, Massachusetts. Sometimes in lieu of an official recording of birth, which may not have existed, some files will include signed affidavits by those who witnessed the birth. A file might also include internal correspondence from the Bureau of Pensions related to any discrepancies or conflicts that had arisen with regards to the widow's claim to the veteran's pension. This particular letter was included in Annie Townsend's pension file. The conflict being discussed is whether she is eligible to receive the pension of Charles Townsend, her second husband, or William Chick, her first husband. Annie was unable to show proof of divorce from her first husband, William Chick, rendering her second marriage invalid in the eyes of the Pension Bureau. Further complicating matters was the fact that Laura Chick, William's second wife, was receiving his pension despite the Bureau not having record of divorce for marriage to Annie, his first wife. As a letter states, this claimant, by reason of the action taken in the claim, is placed in rather an anomalous situation and one difficult to defend by the Bureau. And this particular document may also be of value to researchers, as it includes information about other WO and WC files related to this one. One might also find affidavits taken from neighbors, friends, coworkers, employers, and others familiar with the widows and veterans relationship. These were used as additional evidence to support the widow's claim for her deceased husband's pension. In this particular affidavit taken from WC 893-807, Charles H. Proctor, a resident of Lynn, Massachusetts, certifies that he had known the Townsends for about five years, that they had never divorced, and that Annie was not remarried, and finally that she had no property except clothing and household furniture and no income except for that derived from her own labor. There have also been some examples of women being denied pensions due to bad reputations or bad standing in the community. Um, if they kept company with the wrong sort of people, quote unquote wrong, or had children out of wedlock, situations like that, they might have been denied a pension. In some cases, the Bureau of Pensions would send a special examiner to investigate widows' claims. Here we have a deposition conducted by Special Examiner N.B. Miller, who interrogated Lula L. Haas about her knowledge regarding the marriage of William and Laura Chick. These transcribed depositions often provide valuable information to genealogists. The information contained in them includes addresses, names, and dates, as well as personal feelings regarding the marriage, the nature of the relationship, happy, sad, struggling, thriving, and answers as to the character and personalities of the individuals in question. So 
So a clear narrative emerges upon reading special examiner's transcribed depositions, as well as comprehensively reviewing all previously presented documents in a widow's pensions case file. For this particular case file, Annie Chick Townsend's, the narrative gleaned from the depositions shown in these slides is as follows. Charles Townsend served in the Civil War as a private in Company F, 35th Massachusetts Infantry, and was honorably discharged after being shot in the right hand at Antietam on September 17, 1862. Charles ma married Nellie Durrell, with whom he had four children, but she died sometime before 1869. That year, the widow of Charles hired Annie Denton Chick to help him keep house and raise his motherless children. The relationship soon turned romantic. On July 22, 1870, Charles married Annie Denton Schick, and four months later, their first son was born. The Townsends settled into life in Rockport, Massachusetts, where Charles was employed as a machinist. Together, they enjoyed 26 years of marriage, raising Charles's four children from his first marriage, nine children of their own, and Annie's son from her first marriage, Leon Schick. Annie's first marriage had been tumultuous, short, and plagued by accusations of infidelity. She married William Chick, her first husband, on April 11, 1867, and their son Leon was born shortly thereafter. When Leon was three months old, William Chick went to Erie, Pennsylvania to find railroad work while his wife and son visited family in Nova Scotia. Annie received word from William's sister that her husband was, quote, too attentive to a local girl while she was away. Upon her return, Annie says, she did not room with him as I was high spirited and he did not show that he was sorry for his behavior. And in the first document, the leftmost one, she actually says that she wanted to tar and feather him, which I thought was very interesting. After he parted ways with Annie, William married Agnes McNulty, his second wife, on August 21st, 1870. Agnes died on October 7th, 1897, and William married a little over a month later, on November 23, 1897, to Laura de Edda Stoneberry. Meanwhile, on October 17, 1897, Charles Townsend died probably of apoplexy, and in December 1897, Annie applied to the Bureau of Pensions for a widow's pension. Her claim was rejected, however, due to insufficient proof of her obtaining a divorce from her first husband, William. In fact, Annie and William had never officially filed for divorce. Chick married his third wife, Laura, in Pennsylvania, where courts would presume divorce of prior marriages automatically to license subsequent unions. The case was otherwise in Massachusetts, where Annie and Charles Townsend had wed. The courts in that state would only validate a marriage if previous marriages had been legally dissolved by an official filing of divorce papers. Annie found herself in the legal gray area. In spite of her 26 years and nine children with Charles Townsend, as far as the Bureau was concerned, she was still the wife of William Chick. However, when William Chick died in 1916, Laura de Edda Stoneberry Chick, his third wife, was granted a pension as his widow. According to recorded interrogation by Special Examiner N.B. Miller, Laura Chick had never heard William mention his first wife, Annie, nor their son, Leon. Laura had only become aware of Annie's existence in May of 1917 when Laura's pension was suspended pending the investigation of Annie's pension application claim that she, Annie, was a legal widow of William Chick. Although Annie was ultimately denied a pension as Chick's widow, her 1920 application for a pension as Townsend's widow was allowed after much wrangling by the Board of Review, Law Division, and Commissioner. Sometimes you'll find some gems like correspondence written in the widow's own hand. With these documents, researchers and genealogists are able to discern a little bit more about ancestors and other individuals' lives and personalities. As an example, here's an impassioned April 6, 1923 letter to the Secretary of the Interior that Annie, then 76, wrote. She writes, it seems to me that all widows should be treated alike. Federal laws are higher than state laws, and every widow should receive the same treatment from the federal government. 
For the federal government to take advantage of a state law in order to debar an aged widow would indicate that some of our lawmakers are very small men in very large places. In all these weary years of struggling in the narrow edge of want and sorrow, I've never found that my God was good. It is only the good in the heart who suffer. He renders all good things of this world to evildoers. What comes next, no one honors. I have been a good citizen and have brought up a large family. My grandchildren were among the first to volunteer for the defense of their country. We are always ready to face whatever comes in the line of duty. War, whenever it comes, my children and grandchildren are ready. I wanted to include this to illustrate that these are more than old papers just housed in archival boxes. They really are just a testament to the lives lived and the challenges faced by women in the face of this massive, complicated, Byzantine bureaucratic network. Um, and I think by examining the correspondence and other records in Annie Townsend's case file, we learn much more than the dates and sequence of events. We also get a real sense of her self-described high-spirited personality in her correspondence and in the recorded examinations, especially the ones where she described what she wanted to do to her first husband. So thank you for listening. Um, as pension records are heavily requested, the research staff here at NARA is very experienced and knowledgeable, and they can definitely help you out if you decide to come visit us in person. If you're unable to visit us in person, you can send us a message at inquire at nara.gov. Um, full pension application requests are available online at archives.gov as well, if you're not available to research in person. Um, a request involves filling out form NATF 85, and there is a fee that you pay as well. Um, so thanks a lot. I hope you enjoy the info presented and that it helps you going forward, and good luck on your research. Thank you, Alex. That was great. Um, I just want to remind everybody before we start asking questions that her handout and her presentation slides are available online on the Genealogy Fair webpage, and I just added links to that in the YouTube chat. So if, if you haven't already, sign into the chat and you can also ask questions. So let's get into them. Uh, someone asked at the, towards the beginning of your presentation uh, about final payment information. They said that there was no final payment information in the file that they received. Where might they find that final payment information? I don't know that information off the top of my head. Um, Claire Kleskins is actually sitting in the audience, so I'm going to go and try and steal her if you know this off the top of your head. Okay, so so she says there's not always going to be a final information payment in the file if it's um, from 1907 Seven. to 1933. Um, there is a microfilm publication with that information. Um, you might try researching that uh, through the archives catalog. Um, if you can't find any information that way, definitely send us um, a request with all of the information that you have on you. Um, at inquire.nara.gov, and we'll get one of our research archivists to answer that question in full detail for you. Thank you, thank you both. So the next question, um, <laughs> digitization. I know you guys have been working hard, so the question is, what percentage of Civil War widows' pension files have been digitized, and when do you expect the digitization to be complete? I think less than half are digitized right now. Um, the ones that are digitized are available on Fold 3. Um, I don't have final dates for that. I don't know that they're actively being digitized by staff. We do have several scanathons going on where citizen archivists and volunteers um, will come in and scan those. Um, you're welcome to come in and scan those as well. Um, it's always a fun time to go through them and make them available for researchers that way. Thank you. Another plug for uh, what our first session folks were talking about, about the citizen archivist. So our next question, um, sounds like somebody's files went missing. Uh, they said that I ordered a pension file for a soldier in the index. NARA says that they no longer have the file. 
Can you explain what might have happened in this case where this NARA, this person thinks that the report back was that they no longer had this file for a pension? I, with, with regards to the specific file, um, I, I, we can't really answer what happens to um, individual files. Um, I mean, any number of things could have happened. If they're no longer in our custody, um, send us another request um, with all the information you have. We'll do our best to track it down for you. Um, if, if the files were still active around 1930, there's, there's a small chance that they could be filed um, in the records of the Veterans Administration. Oh, good question. Yeah, good answer. I was also thinking that possibly some records might have been damaged in I think there was a fire at there one point. There was a point. fire in St. Louis, I believe. And then um, I think there was another one in the 70s at one point, right. too, sadly. So the next question, um, they ask about somebody who is actually with the Teamster. A relative worked at a Teamster delivering supplies to the military for the Union. So they were a Teamster delivering supplies to the military wouldn't he be entitled to some sort of pension? Um, the pensions that are specific to uh, Record Group 15, Entry 12A, the widow's pension files, um, I don't believe include Teamsters records. These are only for the widows who um, had a husband who was deceased and had served in the Union Army specifically. Thanks. Looking to see if there's any more questions online before I let you go. Scrolling backwards. People are saying, great presentation. That was a really good, pre great presentation. I learned a lot. Someone's having trouble interpreting the cursive handwriting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have that problem too sometimes. Yeah. We have a lot of good handwriting experts on staff though. Oh, fantastic. So I think that concludes your presentation. Uh, if something occurs to you later and you do want to submit a question to us, please send it to inquire at nara.gov.